And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple. Some of you may know him as the man behind How to GM Like a Fucking Boss. Others may know him as Mr. O5E, and but st and some of you still may know him as the man behind Chaalt. But to, but to us here, he is best known as the man of a thousand tentacles, Venger Satanis. How you doing today, man? Hey, you doing good. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for thanks for coming on. So, the last time I had you on, it was a bit of it was a bit of a scattershot affair because we were because we were trying to. Compre we're trying to compress a good ch a good chunk of your bibliography into into or into a shorter affair, mm. but for this yeah. one I'd like to ex especially with the kickstarting of um, Chaturudu's Shadows, I'd like to focus more exclusively on the ch on the Chaalt setting. Okay. So, I guess we can start. I guess we can start at the humble beginnings. How did? The, how did the initial concepting for Ch for Chalt come to be? Um. Well, I I, uh, I knew at the back of my mind that I wanted my own campaign setting, mm -hmm. and that I wanted a place where all of my stuff kind of fit together and. It wasn't just like isolated adventures or modules like the Islands of Purple Haunting Putrescence mm -hmm. it takes place kind of in its own world. Um, and it's it's being islands, it's kind of isolated. And I didn't really go into a lot of detail back then for where this stuff takes place um, beyond like way, it's way over here and mm -hmm. you guys have never heard of it but that's where it is uh same thing with liberation of the demon slayer it assumes that yeah this is kind of just like a DD world pseudo medieval but there's like lovecraftian stuff going on and and you know probably more demons than normal and you know i tried to mesh my aesthetic and the things that I like with quote unquote normal D and D. Um, and I just got to a point where I needed, you know, a room of my own. Um, I needed the space and all the things that go with the campaign campaign setting, not just like the name of a random planet where the, or a kingdom where this stuff is taking place, mm -hmm. but, um, like, a backstory and um, other places nearby and you know the whole thing when you come up with your own campaign setting mm -hmm. and I wanted it to be just extremely venger because you know because I'm doing it and <laughs> it just made sense to, to make it as suitable for me in my style of gaming the things I like as possible mm -hmm. so not only to make it so everything fits and then I would be really passionate about it and that passion would hopefully carry over and get other people enthusiastic about it. But, um, you know, I'm the only one that's Venture Satanus. And so if I don't do my own kind of stuff justice and leap forward with what I like, then who will? Mm -hmm. So I just kind of went for it and you know a lot of people liked it and uh one thing kind of led to another so yeah i'm kickstarting the third book of the trilogy uh Charles chartreuse shadows mm -hmm. and hopefully that gets funded and then next year that book comes out then the trilogy will be complete and then after that i don't know what i'm gonna do did you initially design chalt as a trilogy or did it just happen that way um, 
I, I, in the back of my mind, I think I hoped that I would get more mileage out of it than just one book. Uh, not only did I make a big financial investment in Chalt, but creatively, I think I would feel unfulfilled if it was just the one book and then never anything else. I mean, I suppose I could have come up with like PDF adventures, which I did end up doing later and kickstarting those. Uh, but it was always my intention to not just do one book, but uh, multiple books. Mm -hmm. And this book, the Chal Chartreuse Shadows, will encompass uh, the previous uh, adventures that got the PDF treatments, but never got um, any kind of print treatment. So those those could be inside that. And then I'm also working on a new mega dungeon called Kremzom Erikzom. Mm -hmm. And then that's going to be like the big centerpiece for the new book. Yeah. Now there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of genre elements within within Ch within Chaalt. Um mm -hmm. not just not just old, not just old school fantasy because that because obviously that's a very that's a very um, wide net to cast. Yeah. But but think but things like Eldrix, things like Gonzo, things like things like science fan things like um science fantasy. And when you ha when you have when you have all of the when you have all of those elements, it's mm -hmm. one of those things where it could where where it could easily it could easily be um seen as where seen as where as where to start which mm -hmm. is which is why one thing that i'm curious about is for lack of a better term the elevator pitch that you that you might give when presenting to alt to say a con to say a convention floor for um demos oh what, what is my elevator pitch <laughs> yeah. um Normally, what I say, and this is to attract the people that might be attracted to it and to immediately disqualify the people that have no interest in it because life is short, time is precious, and so is my energy. And I'm not going to go into this whole spiel when to try to like curry their favor or get them interested when I know that uh, they're not interested in, in Gonzo or mm -hmm. something like that. So what I normally say is that Chalt is an eldritch, gonzo, science fantasy, post-apocalyptic campaign setting. Um, if I'm talking about a specific book, like the first Chalt book, then it's got not only the campaign setting, but it's got some cool adventures that can play be played for like like a one shot or like you know one, two, three sessions. Uh, but then it also has a mega dungeon, which is the Black Pyramid of Chalt, mm -hmm. and that's really the highlights and it being a mega dungeon, you can, you know, you can go, you can have a dozen sessions um, exploring the black pyramid and still have stuff left over uh, mm -hmm. to game with. So, but lately I've been adding on to those four descriptors with uh, humor, sleaze and pop cultural references, mm -hmm. because usually that's, that's uh, the kind of stuff that people mention in reviews that I guess I don't really think about, but it just kind of happens that my stuff has that. So those aren't really selling points. Like, hey, um, if you like Dungeons and Dragons and you also like Lovecraft and really weird, crazy shit, and you want to take a look at, you know, women's panties, uh, then this is for you. You know, so I don't really leave with that, but then recently i've also mentioned that too like you know there's humor in it um there's a little bit of uh sexiness or eroticism or sleaze mm -hmm. uh sort of like a grindhouse exploitation kind of feel and then the pop culture references is just something that i add in it's kind of the the gonzo kind of gives it a back door for for making that okay or acceptable Mm -hmm. But sometimes, even beyond the Gonzo blanket, um, you know, I go in there with guns blazing, and I'll write about something that either just happened in the news or a year ago, or you know, I mention movies all the time—the movies and TV shows I grew up with. So there will be references to 
heavy metal or Land of the Lost or Star Wars or mm-hmm. Doom or Star Trek or, you know, it, Crawl or any number of fantasy movies and uh, or science fiction or horror. And uh, I'll throw that stuff in, um, not only because it's easier for people to wrap their mind around and visualize and imagine if they've seen it before, mm-hmm. but also because that kind of stuff speaks to me and I just think it's fun if I can put myself, at least partially, in like the world of aliens. Um, but then there's also like unicorns and I don't know, deep ones and then weird other creatures and tentacles and, you know, someone's casting spells and then all of a sudden it's more like Event Horizon. Um, I don't know. I think that's fun Mm -hmm. for a gamer to put yourself and immerse yourself in that world and then you get to explore that as opposed to just like, okay, you're in a dungeon, it's dark, um, you see some orcs up there, like, what do you do? Yeah. Like, that's cool too, but, you know, how often do you get to to put yourself in, like, one of your favorite movies? Um, That's kind of the gaming that I like, and so I I include a lot of that. And to be fair, a lot of of the, if one, I always, I always find it, I always find it funny when I look at, um, when I look at certain OSR arguments, uh, as if there, as if there was some, there's some grand vision of historical realism intent intended within um intended within um D D over the years when the reality of the situation is 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 Gygax, Arneson and company just th- just throwing in a bunch of stuff they happen to be fans of and mm, yes. not all of it uh, not all of it was trying to was trying to do this um this high verisimilitude approach to medieval Europe in fact, I'd in fact I'd say that stuff ended up being in the in the minority. Mm-hmm. Um, it's and ev- even more so, and you you've probably noticed this as well. There's th- there's this idea that if you're doing fantasy, that it has to be it that it has to has to be in that Western European um, pastiche. Yeah. Otherwise, otherwise, it doesn't count as fantasy. I, I remember, I remember people saying that Planescape, for instance, is too weird to be considered fantasy. Well, that's a weird take, but <laughs> I mean, yeah, people think all kinds of weird stuff. Oh. Um, I mean, but what? But when I look at Chal, the one of the key things I end up t- I end up taking out of it is um, weird tales, as as in the as in the publication. Mm-hmm. Um, especially, especially weird tales, um, a hundred years ago, mm. which is, wh- which is, which is where g- guys like Lovecraft and Howard were really getting, were primarily getting themselves noticed. It was in those yeah. kind of publications that if you were, a, if you were a sci-fi writer, that's how you got yourself noticed. Yeah, like yeah, like the early pulp um, magazines for like weird tales and. and... Yeah, science fiction, fantasy, and there's a lot more blurring of the lines mm-hmm. in that golden age too, which I definitely appreciate. Um, I mean, I've always felt like that. Like, why just have magic and swords when you could also have you know robots and laser swords and other yeah, energy weapons and starships and things like that? Mm-hmm. I mean, not everybody likes that, obviously. Uh, but I certainly do, and so, you know, I make the products that I want to see and that I want to play, um, and hopefully a lot of people will like that too and want to come with me on this journey. But yes, yeah, it's, it's not for everybody. Yeah, everybody has their own opinion. So, walk me through walk me through the the um, process between f- between finishing the original Chalt and the, and then developing. Um, Fuchsia Malaise, which is the second book in the trilogy. Okay. Um, well, since a lot of the reviewers, or I should say some criticism of Chalt was that it didn't really dwell on some of the smaller aspects of the world. 
other than the Black Pyramid. So the, the first book really hones in on the Black Pyramid of Chult. That's, that's like the keystone to the whole book. Um, not that the campaign setting itself and other places were like an afterthought, but I definitely didn't do a deep dive into like other cities or other locations. Um, the city of Kratumek gets a decent amount of coverage just because it features a temple that's beneath Kratumek and also the giant purple demon worm. Um, mm -hmm. that in the second standalone scenario is frozen in the desert because of uh, this polar vortex going on. And then the, the PCs can go inside of the demon um, and explore and things like that. So I knew that going into Shalt, Fuchsia Malays, that I needed to, or I should, focus on other parts of the world and build those out and give people tools to mess around with Chalt and adventure in that world other than the Black Pyramid. And so that was kind of the impetus for that. And then, um, yeah, there are, you know, a bunch of smaller locales and adventures um, and the, the, the high-tech facility uh, Elysium was just an idea I had because I knew that I wanted uh, not just the natives of Chalt to be doing stuff, but a bunch of off-worlders and uh, more science fiction element, you know, aliens and humanoids from other worlds and galaxies to come to Chalt and, you know, steal its resources or try to. And I always like the idea of there's, there's the possibility of another apocalypse coming, like, any day. Um, the old ones could arise um aliens could like steal all this off or all the moisture um or nuclear uh warheads you know uh embedded in subterranean uh vaults and like missile silos could be activated and could um start like a galactic war or they could just be like exploded where they are and destroy the planet so the planet is always like on the verge of maybe possibly being destroyed at any point. And mm -hmm. uh, so I try to think of different things and bring in different elements. I wanted to keep the science fiction elements. And so I thought, you know, why not have off-worlders come into Chalt and, you know, uh, try to rape its environment. And I thought that would be a good place to start so um yeah i just started writing and whatever came out came out mm -hmm. and uh, yeah i'm happy with both and yep. i think uh book number three is just gonna be just as awesome mm -hmm. so yeah and that 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 does bring us to book to book number three mm -hmm. um now what now? What what do you plan on at, What do you plan on adding to that in order to one expand on the sandbox of Ch of Chalt and two um, br bring its bring its own particular flavor compared to the other two books in the trilogy? Okay. Um, well, in some cases, more is more, mm -hmm. and I think just a variety of different scenarios kind of give the, the game master a better feel for what type of adventures can go in there. And I hope little bits and pieces can be are modular enough so they can be taken out and worked with as the game master chooses. And, um, or you could run it, the scenario as is. Um, this one, uh, I mean, Chalt had the Gamma Incel Cantina, which mm -hmm. was kind of a nod to Alpha Blue in that it was very uh, hypersexualized mm -hmm. and definitely on the sleazier side. Um, Chalt Fusion Malays, every once in a while there'd be like a stray reference or something, um, but I didn't have anything like that in there. But now in book three, there's also going to be uh, some slightly sleazier material and then also some optional rules for, um, like, 
upping the uh, the sexual quotient. Uh, mm-hmm. Like if your characters in the game want to have sex or something like that, then this is how to approach that. Um, these are the kind of bonuses you could expect. Uh, this is how we incentivize certain activity. Um, you know, I put in kind of different helpful notes on how to handle that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's definitely something you don't have to do. But if you want to, um, you know, the the guides are there. And you can use that to um, create a slightly different experience um, than maybe most people are used to. Mm-hmm. Now, I think I answered your question. I, yep. If I didn't, um, no, if I missed an aspect. Let me know. No, no, no worries. These are these are the kind of answers that I that I always expect and I always I always um, prepare okay. for. Um, but one of the but one of the one of the other thi- one of the other things that that I do that I do find interesting that you're bringing into um Chatteruth's shadows is a full on mega dungeon which mm-hmm. unless I'm mistaken this would be this would be the first time that you've do- that you've done that kind of thing for this particular series um well the the black pyramid is a is a mega dungeon mm-hmm. so this the mega dungeon I'm working on now for book three, Kremzom, mm-hmm. is would be number two. All right, I, st- I stand corrected on that. Sorry about that. But it's a completely different kind of mega dungeon because the Black Pyramid is supposed to be weirdly unique and it's all self-contained and it, it doesn't operate like a traditional mega dungeon really at all. Um, it's, it's just like a bizarre fun house. Mm-hmm. Um, and like you walk into one room and you know you could be fighting uh, or encounter a dragon and in the very next room you're on like a tropical beach like walking along the shore like wondering what the fuck is going on and then maybe these Zardoz stone heads are like you know coming on the horizon to attack you or something like that I don't know mm-hmm. like just weird stuff that doesn't make any sense like right next to other stuff so it, it's supposed to be, you know, kind of batshit insane and, and really like, what the fuck? Yeah. But um, this one is still going to have a lot of what the fuck moments, but it's going to be, it's going to make more sense. Uh, like everything on level two will kind of be related to each other mm-hmm. on some, in some ways. And it won't be like this jarring, like, you know, you know, first it's one thing, and then it's something completely wildly the antithesis of, of the first. Mm-hmm. Uh, everything will be more related, and instead of being in this weird locale, um, like inside this black pyramid, it, it's just going to be like a series of, of caves and tunnels, um, and, and a succession of levels going steadily down um, underneath the surface. So in that way, it's more of a traditional um, mega dungeon rather than the Black Pyramid, which was designed to just be like a one-off, unique, just craziness. Mm -hmm. Uh, So this one is going to be more sane, but it's also definitely going to have the Eldritch Gonzo and the science fantasy and the post-apocalypse and, you know, everything else. More more sane. I feel I feel like I should put a giant asterisk right next to the word sane <laughs> in that regard. Yeah, there's there's some yeah, there's some weird stuff in there that you're like, just yeah, a lot of people would be shaking their heads. They're like, oh, Avenger, bless your bless your slimy green tentacles. <laughs> um, and when when it comes to that, I I would like to go a bit into um tone. Like, mm-hmm. given the given the fact that there's going to be that there's going to be a whole lot of weirdness whenever whenever one's delving into Chahal, whether it, whether it be in the previous two books or in or in Chatteru's Shadows, um, how do you how do you maintain that le- just to, just from a GM perspective, how do you maintain that level of weird, especially in an era when so many people are on some level or another genre savvy? Um. If players and game masters don't hate it, then I feel like 
um, just the raw excitement and fun of combining those disparate elements um, is enough to um, to keep you going and keep you excited about the game and um, keep your mind sharp enough where you can sort of come up with things on the fly and just spontaneously go in different directions, even, you know, something that just occurs to you creatively that isn't written down, but you're just kind of like um, being influenced by the vibe. And then that sort of like carries you through. Uh, obviously, if you hate that kind of thing, um, just don't buy it because you won't be happy. Uh, there isn't enough like normal bog standard D and D stuff to carry you through if you just don't like Gonzo or you don't like um, genre mixing or you just detest Lovecraft and think tentacles are overplayed and just stupid. Don't don't even like bother with Chult because you would not like it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think I think I answered it. Yeah. Okay. Now. In that in that in that um in that same vein, um, as temp as tempting as it as tempting as it is to to say, to say just to say just add tentacles when wanting to make something um weird, mm -hmm. um, what are some what are some other what are some other means that that um that you that you would that you would recommend to GMs in order to add. In order to add, in order to add a bit of weirdness when when go, when going into places in Chald, other than the major dungeons like the like the Black Pyramid. That's a great question. Um, so yeah, the lowest rung of the weird ladder would probably be like, oh well, I want to, you know, I want to have the players and their characters encounter, you know, this this demon or this ogre or these oryx or a dragon, mm -hmm. I'll just add some tentacles and then I'll be done. I mean, that's kind of like the, the lowest, uh, the lowest level of weird. Then you could just try to rack your brain and come up with some non-standard isms mm -hmm. um, to include, like not only are there tentacles to this, say, demon, but um, there's some special ability it has, or special defense, or there's something strange about it mechanically, or you know how it how it fights, or what it can do uh, that players will appreciate. Um, and then you can keep going with like the surface or the the outer trappings. Um, to make it weird, weirder. So let's say you, you have a demon and it's got tentacles and now it's got like all these weird special powers, maybe like spell like abilities. And then on top of that, you want to give it, um, you come up with something else like maybe it lives inside the Kool-Aid man mm -hmm. somehow as it, it, like this liquid form or something like that. And so maybe first you encounter the, the Kool-Aid man breaking through the proverbial brick wall. He's like, hey, or whatever he says. And then um, if the glass pitcher that is the Kool-Aid man uh, cracks, then uh, this, you know, red liquid comes out and then that's the demon. So then he, that's like, you know, a further level, level of weird. Um, and then... At the, at the top most, or the apex of the pyramid, I would say uh, forget the demon and forget everything else I just said and just try to come up with something that almost literally <laughs> doesn't make any sense. Um, something that's, that's not tied to reality at all. Uh, instead of coming up with a thing and making it weird, just focus on the weirdness itself mm -hmm. and then whatever that would lead to. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of like a whole other realm of weird that a lot of people don't do or they don't think about, but that's definitely a possibility. Um, and that's definitely something that I use not all the time because it's not only 
exhausting to come up with like over and over and over again. But if you're playing a game and it's all uh, just, just what the fuck, random, bizarre weirdness, um, that would get exhausting to play through too. Um, so I'd say have somewhere between one, two, or three really, really weird things per session and not mm-hmm. any more than that because then you're going to exhaust the player's um, tolerance for weirdness. And then um, then they won't get as much excitement out of it because it's been overdone. Uh, or, or they're just like, they can't wrap their brains around it because you've thrown so much weirdness at them that they, they'll like reject mm-hmm. uh, the believability of whatever you say because it's constantly so far past their conception uh, but you've lost them. Yeah. Um, I'd say I'd say in that I'd say in that regard when you mentioned um, when you mentioned a level of weird oh, that that higher tier of weirdness. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know I don't know if it's just me, but what immediately came to mind is the is the kind of weirdness that you would see in early ex, early um, early or even later expressionist style painting. Mm-hmm. Um. And in and in partic- in particular the kind of stuff that say um so that say Salvador Dali would do. Especially yes. stuff like the persistence of memory. Where things yeah. are just normal enough to re- to recognize but still right. but still off. Um Yeah, surrealism is is good for that yeah. because it uses familiar things in a weird way that allows the, the audience or the, the person looking at it to wrap their head around it and make their own kind of sense of what it means. Yeah. Um, and if you go to like the abstract expressionist uh, kind of aesthetic, mm-hmm. then yeah, you're kind of leaving the surrealism behind and you're going for that super weird. Um, but you got to be careful with that, like I said, because. Um, you could burn out mm-hmm. on that, uh, but in small doses, I think that's great, and it highlight and it it um, raises up um, the slightly weird stuff that you have. Yeah. So you have some nice surrealism stuff and some nice, um, ex- uh, whatever postmodern expressionism, mm-hmm. and then every once in a while you'll have like, you know, a nice landscape. Or, or some watercolors, um, uh, you know, Van Gogh's night sky or whatever. Mm-hmm. And you have a nice, a nice mix and a nice range and it kind of elevates everything. Um, you don't need to do that. You don't need to throw in one or another to get a nice balanced version uh, of Chult. But I like the variety. I appreciate that. And I think my players do too when they're not exactly sure what to expect if it's rather normal or slightly weird or really weird or like that top tier weirdness where they're mm-hmm. just like oh my god what is that what the hell's happening now yeah in that regard when it comes to when it comes to this sort of layers of weirdness that we've that we've been delving into i'm curious where you would put wayne barlow's hell in that um Is, uh, is <laughs> the name sounds very familiar. He's an artist, right? Yes. Okay. Um, I have one of his books on aliens that's got some like cool Lovecraft stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I have. A, does he have a book on demons? Um, is that what that he is? Did, he d- yeah he did he did a he did a bo- he did a book and a lot of the art is is on his site on okay. his, on his particular depiction of hell and. It is. Let me, let me go Google it quick. Uh, uh, yeah, it is very. Un, it is a very unorthodox depiction. I can. I can say. I can say that at the very least. Um. Okay. All right. I'm looking at it now. Mm-hmm. That's cool. He is a great artist. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, I can totally see. What you, it's like it's like a darker surrealism. It's like um, yeah, if you combine like weirdness with your normal versions of of like hell and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's kind of where I want to go with, with the new mega dungeon, uh, Kremzon Eric Sound. I, uh, because it's built on a Hellmouth, which obviously I borrowed, um, from Buffy, the, the vampire slayer. Mm -hmm. Um, and obviously I'm twisting it too. I'm not just using it as is, but the, the bottom most layer or level of the mega dungeon um uh, does have you know a slightly open gateway to hell and that's where all the demons are coming from and that's where um basically this demon god is waiting um just outside and then one of the goals of like the cultists and the demons is to fully open the the hell mouth wide enough for this demon god to come through um and then once that happens then you know it's kind of game over for a lot of people or a lot of aspects of the setting uh it's one of those apocalyptic events where you could go in a number of directions uh however creatively the game master wants to to go it could be like absolutely the end of the world or it could be well this is the new big bad and um the player character efforts are going to be focused on either serving this demon god or mm -hmm. staying the hell away from him or actively fighting against him mm -hmm. um, so and I, obviously i want a lot of weird demonic shit throughout crimson or exam because that's going to be one of the the feels um of the dungeon that's going to be one of the the vibes I want to um, explore. So it's, it's definitely going to have stuff like uh, Wayne Barlow's Hell because, because um, yeah, I wanted to have that, uh, that sort of thing going on. Yeah, I, I can, cer I can certainly see that. I, I wanted to bring that, I wanted to bring that kind of thing up just as an example of how to, how to introduce weird in a in a way that um that is that has variety mm -hmm. um since well <laughs> not to sound too cheesy about it but variety is the spice of life and whoever controls the spice controls the universe <laughs> that's true <laughs> yeah variety is key and um and you gotta have good art mm -hmm. because if, if people can't visualize what you're talking about in the right way then a lot of the setting is just going to be lost on them and yeah. that that's kind of sad so yeah i'm going to try to get and use as much cool art as i can um so that's another reason why i'm trying to seek as much money as i can because really great art is expensive and i want as many great pieces as i can in this book um because that just enhances um the setting and um just the book itself yeah and speaking of art with with a lot of with a lot of the work in the in this in this particular trilogy one thing that i couldn't one thing that i couldn't help but notice is a lot of is the addition of a lot a lot of what i'll call runic script mm. um when it came when it came to when it came to write when it came to writing those was that was were those designs something you came up on the fly or were those things that you had collaborated with your artists with on how on how you wanted those those particular scrawls to look? Uh, it was kind of a kind of a collaboration. Um, a lot of it came from the artist Zarano. Mm-hmm. Uh, who does a lot of Lovecraftian stuff, a lot of Cthulhu Mythos stuff, and I've been friends with him for a long time. I've used uh, many of his art pieces in prior books, and I asked him if, for his permission if I could use his basic glyphs and sigils and runes. Um, and not only use some of them verbatim, but also use... Um, 
the way he, he does it as sort of a template for the stuff that would appear in Charles. And, uh, and he said, yes, he was very enthusiastic about that. I'm like, cool. So, um, yeah, a lot of it came from him. Uh, some came from me and then some came from, uh, the various layout people that worked on books two and three, or mm -hmm. sorry, books one and two. Uh, so yeah, it's just kind of a, a big loose collaboration between uh, a variety of artists. Mm -hmm. And w when it came to, was there ever had had there ever been consideration about about trying about trying to write a in universe language, or was that something that was never in the cards? Um, well, one of the things I like to do is to come up with strange words and phrases and then attribute new meanings to them because mm -hmm. I just kind of like came up with a random word. Um, and I, th I think I like that just because I think that's cool as a creative challenge. And I also like that because I think it's more immersive into the setting mm -hmm. and it's more mysterious because you're not just calling it like, the big ax or something it's got like this weird crazy name which means like you know to cut someone's head off or, or something like that um and also i'm pretty good at it i think um coming up with with interesting strange words that um sometimes they're fun to say sometimes they're difficult to say sometimes they carry a certain connotation or, or weight mm -hmm. and I think that just adds to the overall setting um, yeah I can I can certainly get behind that um, now what are you shoot what are you shooting for as far as a total page count with um, Shataru's shadows are you shooting for around 200 uh, I want to I want to go above and beyond that because this might be my last shelf book, and so I really want to go out with a bang. Um, what I'm thinking of is somewhere around 300 pages. Mm -hmm. um, the first two books are somewhere around like I don't know 216, 218, 220, yeah, somewhere in that general area. So I'd like to kind of surprise myself and really go for it and and get something that's closer to 300 pages. But um, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Also depends on the funding. Mm -hmm. um, if I just reach like fifteen thousand, then it's probably going to be closer to two hundred and fifty. But if I can, uh, there's a stretch goal at the, on the campaign, the Kickstarter campaign page. Uh, if I can get to wherever it is, seventeen thousand, twenty thousand, something like that, mm -hmm. then I would love to get all the way to three hundred pages. Um, and then I can afford some great artwork for like the last 50 or so pages. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so yeah, I'm really trying, gonna try to do as much and include as much material as I can, just in case this is the last chalk book I do. Mm -hmm. Although to play devil's advocate on that, there, there was that afterward in the first child where it was described as a magnum opus. So um, yes. Well, this is a, it's a continuation. It's a, it's a magnus, magnum opus continuation. Mm -hmm. um, so the single book, I guess, becomes the series. Mm -hmm. um, and they're all my magnificent octopuses. Octopi? <laughs> exactly. Uh. Yes, please. Oh. <laughs> uh. Although that do, well, that does bring that does bring the question: If you end up eating calamari, is that cannibalism? <laughs> I don't know. I've never. I I don't think I've ever actually had that. Um, and if I did, I, it just I only tasted like that it was fried, uh, like the breading. Mm -hmm. I never remember having calamari and being like, "Oh wow, this actually tastes like like a tentacle." Um, so I could. But I just don't know if I'd like that. Yeah. Um, now, you meant you mentioned. Um, you, I think you had mentioned in passing 2022 as a as a possible release date. Are we are we talking? 
Are we talking like second quarter of 2022? Yeah, I want to have it in hand um, by the middle of summer 2022. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm going to have to... I don't use China or any any place like that to print mm-hmm. the books. I considered that before jumping in with Jolt, and then I discounted that for a number of reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, so the most foreign place that the book would be printed up would be Canada. Um, and over the, sometime over the next month or two, I'm going to be um, researching and investigating the best place or places to have the book printed up. Uh, it's a little premature now because the book probably won't be finished until spring of 2022. Mm-hmm. So maybe like March, April, uh, something like that. And that will hopefully give me a couple months um, to have it ready by July. And I want, I really want to, for the people that attend VentureCon, mm-hmm. which is a old school traditional gaming convention that I'm organizing uh, for the first time next year in July, uh, I want the physical books ready to hand people um, who back the project and attend the convention mm-hmm. or who um, want to just buy it, who are just attending that, that didn't back the, the Kickstarter. So that's definitely a main goal is by the middle of July uh, next year, I want the books in hand. And so I'm going to do whatever I got to do uh, in order to make that happen. I mean, it, there's not going to be like a ton of books. Um, depends on how well the Kickstarter does. Uh, I'll probably do like a thousand, a print run of a thousand books. So I don't think I'm going to have the troubles that like Wizards of the Coast is experiencing now where they've got like millions of dollars worth of books, like just in the ocean um not being able to get to where they need to go because of the economy and um you know shipping and china and all sorts of issues mm-hmm. well i will i will certainly be keeping an eye on how, on how it on how it develops and i and I, and i look forward to to inflicting more more weirdness on on an unsuspecting public or semi-suspecting, I suppose. Yes, <laughs> they suspect only so much. Well, the thing—the thing is, even though even though my players might know that I'd put something weird into it, they don't know. Um, they don't know what it is, and yeah. Well, if I keep if I keep them paranoid, then I keep them honest. Yeah, that's true. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for uh, you know having me on. Mm-hmm. And anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. Cool. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Sounds good. Mm-hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>